I'm honored to be here, excited to be a part of this, and I get to come in every once in a while and speak to you, and uh, I love Elaine and Ethan. They're so supportive to us, and, uh, and we think about you guys and pray for you all the time, and uh, so I'm just honored to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping my voice holds out. I've been sick for about four days, and uh, so hopped up on medicine, living in a fog. I was driving here there yesterday and uh, thought I was driving on the wrong day. Uh, I was in such a fog, so uh, I made it. Everything's good. I actually feel better, but my voice is uh, is not not feeling the same way that I'm feeling. So uh, we're gonna hope it holds out, And uh, and but I'm just thrilled to be here. Love Ethan and Elaine, they came in town and uh, last last weekend to Dallas and we all hung out and went, went and did some fun things, played some putt-putt, went to a Rangers game and, uh, and I, I love their kids so much. Um, I tried to blame them for getting me sick, but they didn't. Um, so I, I asked Elaine, I'm like, have your kids been sick? She's like, no, we're great. And I'm like, well, somehow they gave it to me. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm certain they did. I'm just gonna keep blaming them. So. Uh, but no, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Love you guys. We think about you all the time. Pray for you, and God's doing amazing things here. So welcome if you're watching online. Welcome to the Magnolia campus. We're just happy that we get to, to do church today to celebrate Jesus and what he's doing in our lives, and uh, so I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm a weird person, and uh, I should start with that. So I, I always title the messages pretty weird things, and so I, I decided instead of using the English language, which we all use, uh, I would title it in Latin, so uh, it's called Imago Dei, and that means the image of God, Imago image in Dei, meaning God, and, uh, and it's because I want us to really recognize and think and ponder on the fact that we were made in the image of God, something that we know, but we rarely think about or realize, um, and what we realize even less often is that every single person around us, every person to your left and right in front of you and behind you was also made in the image of God. Looking around at society, maybe getting political every once in a while, maybe seeing the things around us, it's often easy to forget that every single person around us was made in the image of God. Driving in Houston traffic yesterday, I kept forgetting it a lot. Um, It's weird how just the separation of your car window will make you say things to people that you would never say in person. Someone just creeps in your lane a little bit and you you let off on them, but if someone just leaned a little close to you, you wouldn't be like, back off, jerk, get out of my way, you know? Like, we don't operate that way, but we just lose sight of remembering that people are created in the image of God. And uh, so I wanna paint a picture for you. Well, first, let's start with Genesis chapter one. Let's just establish that we were created in the image of God. Genesis chapter one, verse 27 says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Um, Male and female, in, in case anyone wanted to deny that. Both were created in the image of God. So, um, don't poke your, your spouse or anything. I'm just saying that male and female, we were created in the image of God. We bear his image. We're called to bear his image in the right way. And in fact, I think we all, whether believer or unbeliever, we all recognize that we were created in the image of God. Uh, there's a sense of justice that's sort of built within us. Um, if someone accidentally drops a coffee mug on your foot, um, that hurts in a certain kind of way like a physical pain. If someone takes that coffee mug and throws it at you in anger, that hurts in a different way, both physical and emotional. There's something built into us where there's a sense of justice that we need. We have this sense buried deep within us that mankind is made in the image of God because across all peoples, across all cultures, death is mourned and the loss of human life is grieved. The specifics may vary slightly, but when someone is murdered, it triggers a deep sense of injustice within us all and need to try our best to make things right. The the gravest acts of injustice are the ones that mar or destroy the image of God. So um, I wanna paint a picture for you. Gregory of Nyssa, uh, back in 379 AD, 
uh, roughly a little more than 300 years ago after Christ's ascension, uh, death and resurrection and ascension into heaven. Um, the early church fathers, um, it, there was a church service and Gregory of Nice is up there and he's about to give a message. And um, so in, in that crowd uh, that Gregory was gonna speak to, there would have been every type of socioeconomic class represented there. There would have been a lot of diversity in the room. There would have been both slaves and slave owners as slavery was widely accepted at that time. And so uh, I wanna set the stage for you that this is, the, this is the, the atmosphere that Gregory is about to deliver his message in. And, uh, and so everyone's there in the congregation and they're like, what's Pastor Greg gonna preach about today? All right, and so place yourself in 379 AD. But um, to, to have a little bit of fun with it, I recently discovered something called the Gen Z Bible, and my kids are Gen Zers, and I don't ever understand anything they're saying. And so for amusement purposes, I started reading the Gen Z Bible because it's hilarious. And, uh, and also my kids hate when I try to use their terms, and so I've tried to learn them so that I can use them in language. And, uh, and just to drive them crazy. Um, it's pretty slay. Uh, so <laughs> they would be so mad if they were here right now. It's so great. It just pleases me so much. So I decided that since Gregory of Nyssa read from Ecclesiastes chapter 2, um, I thought it would be funny if we picture in 379 AD Gregory of Nyssa reading from the Gen Z Bible. And I would like to present that to you now. <laughs> So <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter two, verse one says, so like I thought to myself, <laughs> let's go, bro. I'm gonna test you, God, by having fun and experiencing all the good stuff, but yo, check this out. It's all pointless in the end. I once said that laughing uncontrollably is just insane, bro. And <laughs> what's the point of this amusement? So I decided to explore the wild world of partying and alcohol while still trying to keep some of my brain cells intact, dog. I wanted to experience the thrill of doing stupid things just to see if there was any point to it all, you know? Like, what's the secret to a fulfilling life on this planet for all the humans out there? And I was willing to do some serious testing to find out. I did some awesome stuff. I built myself sick houses. I started my own dope vineyards. So I like totally created these awesome gardens and orchards and I planted a bunch of dope trees in there with every imaginable fruit, you know? I created some sick pools to water the lit trees and help them grow strong. I had like a bunch of slaves and some of them even had babies, yo. Oh, and I had like mad livestock more than anyone else in Jerusalem before me. All right, so that's, uh, that's how Gregory of Nyssa read it, I assume. I don't know. That's, I think that's what he did back then. So, uh, but Gregory of Nyssa pointed out the pride and arrogance that the author displays here. And what he pointed out in front of this crowd where slavery was widely accepted was that this person failed to recognize the image of God in the people that he thought that he owned. And right there in front of everybody, he called them out and said, this isn't okay. This isn't okay for it to be this way. Right there in front of everybody in a display of powerful pastoral presence in a time where something was widely accepted, he said, this isn't okay. He pointed out that this is a prime example of someone exalting himself over God because he counts as his own what truly only belongs to God. In Genesis, man is given dominion over the plants and the animals but not over other human beings. The very image of God belongs to God and to God alone. And so when someone sees themselves as so different from those that are subject to him, you can surmise that pride has led him to this place of self-elevation. See, God has chosen to give mankind free will. How then do we ever arrive at the place of believing that we can own what has already been made free by God himself? He says, the author there in Ecclesiastes, I bought male and female slaves. Ask you a question, how much did he purchase them for? Because to put a price on a person that is made in the image of God 
is to put a price on something that is absolutely invaluable. What right does anyone have to put a price on the very divine image of our own creator? Whatever price the author paid is indicative to the value that he places on the image of God himself. It violates the idea that they also were given dominion over the earth just like everyone else and makes the divinity in that person a mere commodity to purchase. Matthew 16, 25 says, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? So therefore the soul of a man is more than the price of the whole world. So who in their right mind thinks they can afford to own the image of God? Only God has this kind of power, and you might also say not even God. For scripture says that the gifts of God are irrevocable, and God would not make a slave of humankind. It was God who, through his own will, called us back to freedom when we were slaves of sin. If God does not enslave a free person, then who would consider their own authority higher than God's? Gregory of Nisa told that congregation, slavery violates our equality, it violates our nature, and it violates our dignity. So at this point, you might be thinking, well, that might have been a problem in the past, but I, I'm not that way, and that wouldn't have been me, and this, is, this message doesn't apply to me. But in Matthew 5, it says that uh, although committing adultery is wrong, I say that if you've even lusted for it after your, in your heart, then that's wrong. So if you have ever, and, and I'm speaking to myself too, this is for everyone, if you have ever denigrated the image of God in another person, you've committed that same crime. If you've ever looked down on someone for their status in life, for their looks, for anything outside of the, the, the image that God has placed in each person, we have failed to recognize the image of God in that person. All of us are guilty of this. All of us are guilty of seeing someone as less than in our own eyes and failing to recognize the image of God. In the temples of worldly and pagan religions, there's almost always an image of God that is placed in their temples. Yet in Jewish temples, there was never a need for an image of God to be placed in the temple because we ourselves bear the image of God and therefore no other image is necessary. Another stark difference between Christianity and other religions is that other religions will say that royalty or only certain people bear the image of God. This was common. In 42 BC, Julius Caesar was labeled as being deified for his position. So his son, Augustus, was called the son of God. And yet in Christianity, we say that the image of God is placed in every single person. Every person bears the image of God, therefore is a royal priest in their own right. In a quick and cursory search of scripture, I immediately found at least 15 passages where we are referred to as the body of Christ. I've heard that there's at least 30 reference to this. Um, I went looking through scripture and I got really tired and I just decided to tell you it's a lot. It's in there a lot. It's in there a bunch of times. You can check it out for yourself. A lot of times we think of this as a metaphor, but Paul doesn't even describe it as a metaphor. Instead, he says we plainly, we are the body of Christ. In Ephesians 1, it says, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything. Christ is the head of the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills everything in every way. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27 says, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. So then each of us is a member of the body of Christ and together and in unity, we better portray the image of Christ to others and to creation. And we are called to bear God's image corporately that together, each one of us, in all of our diversity, in all of the ways that we are different, that together we bear his image. If it was only one of us who would bear his image, then we would bear it incomplete. We would be a marred image of it. Instead, we bear it together. And so uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, Paul lays out a, a metaphor about how we work together as the body. It says, just as a body, the one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ, for we are all baptized by one spirit as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given to one spirit to drink. 
Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And he goes on with the analogy even longer than that. So uh, I'm, I'm going to attempt, I read a book um, called Beautifully and Wonderfully Made by Philip Yancey and Dr. Mark Brand. And uh, it's an amazing book. And so I pulled a lot of medical insights from that. So I'm going to attempt to make some comparisons to the medical way that our body works. So I'm going to take Paul's example of the body and take it a little bit further. Um, my disclaimer, though, is I'm not a doctor. And so I read this stuff, and it comes from a doctor, but uh, I'm just representing it to you. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a theologian. Um, I'm what's referred to in the Greek as a doofus. And uh, so I just read this stuff, and, uh, and I just want you to know that, okay? So um, being made in his image, we are put together masterfully, masterfully. So I want you to imagine that here on the stage, I'm going to place... Uh, 300 books, and each of them is a 1,000 pages long. So uh, a book of a 1,000 pages is about that big. 10 books would stack up about this high. And then I go 10, 10, 10, until we get to 300 books, and I stack that here on the page. Now the print in each of those books is tiny because collectively we need to represent 3 billion letters among these books, okay? So 3 billion letters in 300 books that are a thousand pages long each, okay? So just picture all the books that that would take that are lined up here across the stage. If you imagine all of that, those three billion letters make up our individual DNA. That's how defined that code is. And every single one of those letters is so important that if even two of the letters were off, that could create a disease in the body such as cystic fibrosis. So that's, that's, that's our human DNA laid out for you in an image. Now I want you to imagine how small a single cell is in your body, okay? It's a tiny, one tiny little single cell. Every single cell in your body also holds that entire code of three billion letters. But one single cell in your body does not make you the completeness of who you are. Only all of the cells working together creates who you are. So every single one of you carries the entire DNA of the image of God in you. But you alone don't create the body of Christ. Only all of us together operating as individual cells create the body of Christ. And in all of our diversity, that is the only way that we will come together and create the true image of the body of Christ. And only if those cells work together will that body be functioning properly. Only if the church unifies will we actually represent what the image of Christ is to the rest of the world. Just as it works in our body, that is how the body of Christ works and how we present the image of God to the rest of the world. So I want you to just imagine how much coordination that must take and how much obedience it must take for us to be able to do that, that we must work within our individual part, that we cannot lose connection to the head. In Colossians chapter two, it says, such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. This is an illustration. Instead of saying one hand deciding that it's not going to be a part of the body, it's one cell within this body deciding, I'm not going to, I'm not going to help this body. I'm not going to do what I was designed to contribute to this place. I'm not going to volunteer or pray with people or do the things that is required of me because I don't really want to be a part of the body. Instead, I'd rather come in and receive the nutrients that comes into the body, but I'm not going to do my part. If we continue to operate that way, we will not represent the image of God to the world. We bear his image equally. It is found in each and every one of us. So in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 22, it says, On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. They seem to be weaker, but we, must, we have to have them. They are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. The parts that are unrepresentable are treated with special modesty. 
while, while our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have, no, have, should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every single part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. I think of organs like the pancreas, the kidney, the liver, the colon, because they may be the most valuable of all, although in my daily life, they're the ones I think of the least. I seldom feel consciously grateful for them, yet they perform vital tasks that keep me alive every day. I need this reminder because in human societies, we tend to assign worth based on a hierarchy of value. For example, airlines reward highly trained pilots with fine salaries and fringe benefits. Within the corporate world, such symbols as titles, office size, stock options signal the worth of any given employee. In the military, a sergeant salutes superior officers and gives orders to those of lower rank. The uniform and the stripes alert everyone to the soldier's relative status. Living in such a society, my vision often gets clouded. You'll hear people say something that's meant in jest, but it, it becomes a derogatory statement. Like, if I had to, I would quit my job and I would just go be a janitor. And we'll say these things as if this is a lower position. Yet, if you've ever had to go in for a kidney dialysis three times a week, you will understand that the janitor cells in your body are actually extremely important. Without the cleansing of that, we would not be able to live. The Bible directs harsh words to those who, who show favoritism. The book of James spells out a situation we can all identify with. It says, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes comes in. You sh if you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there or you sit at the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? This is a harsh rebuke to the way that we uh, categorize people in our society, in a society that ranks everything from football teams to the best cup of coffee in the world, an attitude of relative worth can easily seep into the church. The association of people who follow Jesus, though, should not operate like a military machine or a corporation. The church Jesus founded is more like a family in which the special needs child has as much worth as his sister, the Rhodes Scholar. It's like the human body composed of cells most striking in their diversity, but most effective in their mutuality. If every cell accepts the needs of the whole body as their purpose, then the body will live in health. It is a brilliant stroke, the only pure egalitarianism you can observe in all of society. In God's eyes, a widow's dollar can match a millionaire's donation. Shyness, beauty, eloquence, race, sophistication, none of these matter, only faithfulness to the head and through the head to one another. In, in, in that book, Dr. Brand tells of working for many years with leprosy patients. Leprosy is maybe not something that we hear a lot here in the States, um, but it's still prevalent in other countries in the world. And Dr. Brand tells a story of having to give a leprosy patient some difficult news. So having to give him this difficult news out of compassion, he placed his hand on his shoulder and he said, I have to tell you some difficult news. And he gave him the diagnosis. The young man began to cry. Dr. Brand said, I can, I can tell that this news disturbs you by your tears. Um, is there anything I can do for you? And the young man said, my tears are not because of your diagnosis. My tears are because you placed your hand on my shoulder and no one has touched me in years. Jesus, you can see in all of his ministry, walked around caring for leprosy patients in, our, in, a, in these day and age where our physical beauty is placed as such a premium. You can be rich and famous simply by the way that you look, but Christians should stand out as beacons of love by countering this cultural norm. We've all seen Jesus as depicted as this beautiful Eastern European character with a long beard and flowing hair and glowing skin and things like that, you know, like all the depiction of Jesus, he looks beautiful. Um, and actually, you can go back and look at what Josephus described Jesus as looking, and uh, it's pretty shocking. But the only description that we have in the Bible of what Jesus actually looked like is from the Old Testament. It's a prophecy of what Jesus would look like in, when he came to the earth. Isaiah 53, 2 says, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. 
nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Uh, I think of the time of Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem when he's gonna be crowned king, or at least that's what the people thought. And so most kings would ride into town on a large war horse and, and everyone would, would celebrate his mighty valor. And uh, Jesus instead chose to ride in on the foal of a donkey. That means the kid of a donkey, uh, like a, a young donkey. Um, and uh, if you don't know this, no one has ever looked cool riding on a donkey. Um, we were in New Mexico and we went on this uh, horse ride and uh, it got a little it got a little scary. Even our guide got bucked off and uh, so the horses got a little rattled or whatever. And so we made it back to the house that evening. We were talking about how crazy that day was. And my brother-in-law, Jonathan, he was like, man, when all the horses got crazy, I held mine under control and I just felt so cool. Like, I, look, I think I looked awesome when I was riding my horse today. And Hannah and I just busted out laughing. We were like, um, did you realize that because you were the only one with a kid riding with you, when they put all of us on horses, they actually put you on a donkey. And, uh, and while we all rode at this level, you were about right here, just so you know, all right? And uh, so Hannah, my wife, she goes, actually, I got a picture of you if you want to see how cool you look. And so just to embarrass my brother-in-law, I'd like to show you what he looked like right here. Look how cool that guy is. Look how cool. My wife is much shorter than him, and she took this picture from a very elevated status over him. Um, you just don't look cool on a donkey, all right? Jesus, presenting himself as the king of the Jews, came in on the kid of that donkey right there. Feet dragging on the ground, head lower than it would have been if he had just stood up and walked into the city. That's how Jesus presented himself. And if you think that it's degrading in some way to talk about Jesus's stature as being not beautiful and not, not, not wonderful to behold, if you think that that's degrading, if you were one of those people that he ministered to that suffered from physical deformities like leprosy, he would have been a sight for sore eyes to you. Because Jesus, even as he's described here, bore the image of God more than any human being that has ever walked the face of the earth. And so he humbled himself and he walked the earth in that way. We bear his image in sharing pain. So one of the most fascinating things about the way the body processes pain is that there are certain parts of the body that cannot feel pain. So uh, if you have distension in, in, your, uh, in your intestines, you might feel some sort of discomfort or pain, but if you were having surgery on your intestines, they can cauterize, they can cut, they can do whatever, and the body feels no pain in that area. Um, if, uh, if, you go, if you went into the doctor and you said, there's pain in my left shoulder, he would wonder if you were having a heart attack because the heart doesn't actually feel the pain, but it borrows the pain from, from, from the, the, the other parts of the body. This is referred to in the medical field as referred pain. So I want you to gather what really happens here is that there are voiceless parts of the body that cannot express that there's a problem and the pain that they're feeling. So it borrows the voice of other parts of the body, sends a signal to the head and says there's pain going on here. This is the way the body of Christ is supposed to work. There are voiceless people all around us in our community that have no voice to express the pain that they're feeling. And this is why we pray is because we petition to the head of the body and we say there is pain going on here. It is referred pain. We are supposed to feel the pain of those around us. The disease of leprosy, the reason that lepers get so deformed is actually because their body stops being able to feel pain. So they can get burned. They can be walking and sprain their ankle and not even realize it and continue walking on it until it gets worse and worse. And what I'm really worried about is that maybe the church has a bad case of leprosy. In all of our triumphalism and wanting to feel like conquerors over everything, we've lost the ability to feel pain. And what happens when you don't feel pain is it means you can't feel when you're causing pain in others. Dr. Brands had a leprosy patient that couldn't get his shoes off, and so he thought maybe he's gotten so weak from his disease. So he did a test, and he said, here, shake my hand, and I want you to squeeze it as tight as you can. And soon Dr. Brand was nearly in tears begging him to stop. And he said he realized on that day 
that when we can't feel pain, we also can't and we can't feel the pain that we're inflicting on others. When the church stops being able to feel the pain of the community around us, when instead we judge, when instead we lose sight of the image of God, we become the ones who inflict the pain in our community. We must be referred pain. We must give voice to the voiceless. We must act as Jesus' hands and feet. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26 says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. We also bear his image in humiliation. Christ suffered three humiliations. He obviously humbled himself, but humility is a place that you place yourself in. Humiliation is a place that others try to put on you. And so Jesus, people said, oh, he's just the son of a carpenter. How can anything good come from Nazareth? People put humiliations on him or attempted to. So I think Christ suffered three great humiliations. The first one is his death and, uh, or the first one is his actual incarnation, to humble himself to become a man. The second one is his death, the death and the resurrection. But the third one is the one I want to focus on right now. I think the third humiliation that Christ suffered is the church. Because Christ was here doing the ministry, and then he said, now I'm going to put the work of the ministry in your hands. If you're a business owner, you know that your name is on the business, and when you delegate a job to someone else, you're opening yourself up to the possibility to be humiliated. And we have not always been able to bear the image in the way that God has commanded us to. And if we don't change it, we will not be a beacon of light to our community anymore. I have a friend um, named Scott Graham. He was incarcerated for drugs, and he spent a year in prison, and he started going to one of the prison campuses that Gateway has in, inside the prison. And he wanted to get his life right. And so he went to that prison campus every day, and when he got out of prison, he decided, I'm going to go now to, to one of the Gateway campuses. So he walked into that campus, tattoos all over his body, reeking of cigarette smoke, feeling extremely out of place having just come out of prison. And one of the campus pastors, Landon Benjamin, made a beeline over to him and said, hey, welcome, man. I want you to know you're welcome here, and, and we want you here. What Landon did was that he saw the image of God in that person that everyone else might have looked down on. Today, Scott Graham is the volunteer prison campus pastor for that campus. He owns two businesses, and he employs people directly out of prison, and he runs a ministry where we have a house where we can house 10 people directly out of prison and help them get jobs, get their driver's license, and get their feet back under them. And that all happened because someone saw the image of God in him. I read this story of a soldier who had been horribly disfigured in, in, in the war. And he had friends who suffered a similar plight, and when they came home, their, their spouses didn't want to be with them anymore. And he was terrified of that. And so he came home and his wife said, I love you all the same. This changes nothing. And so he said he learned that as he would walk around in the city and people would divert their eyes and not look at him and not talk to him because of his deformity, that they were functioning as a bad mirror that showed him what he really looked like. And so when he started to feel down about the way he would look, he would rush home and he would walk in to see his wife smiling and happy to see him. And he told her, you're the mirror that actually shows me what I really look like. Our job and our role as the church is that every time someone looks at us, we would be a mirror that shows them that they truly represent the image of God. That's our role and that's our responsibility. And maybe you're like that person who feels isolated, pushed out by society, and maybe you need to be reminded today that you bear the image of God, and you're in the right place to be reminded of that. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? In a minute, we're just going to have prayer time here at the front. If you need prayer for anything at all, we want to pray with you, and especially if you've had a hard time accepting or remembering that you bear the image of God, we want to pray with you today and be the right mirror for you. But Lord, I pray that every single person here, that as we go out of this place and into the community, 
that every single person that looks at us would look at a mirror that reflects your image back to them. Lord, that we would bear your image properly. And Lord, that we would see those who are lost, who are hurting, who are despised. And that when everyone else diverts their eyes, Lord, we would lock eyes with them and that we would show them that they bear your image. Lord, would you cause us to be a group of people that properly bears your image, that truly operates as your hands and your feet here on earth, that does the work of your ministry of reconciliation, of healing, of hope, of salvation. Lord, would you give us the strength to not see things through the worldly way of seeing things, but instead to see every single person we encounter through your eyes. And Lord, would you give us the ability to look around and see you everywhere, to cherish creation, to cherish the ones that you've put in our lives, and Lord, to be ministers of hope, truth, justice, life, peace, joy, kindness. Lord, give us the ability to be mirrors that show everyone around us that they also were made in your image. We humble ourselves and we pray all these things in your name.